Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's time to get going, I think. Good turnout. Great to see everybody. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this very special event hosted by Jen. That's, the, of course, the Jesus Entrepreneur Network. Uh, my name is Stephen Hillian, and I'm an alumnus of Jesus College uh, and a proud member of Jen. Uh, my work actually involves leading various data science projects and teams, uh, so I'm really looking forward to tonight's event. Most data scientists that I know are very aware of the ramifications of their work and uh, eager to do the right thing ethically, but right now there really isn't a well-known or at least well-established set of tools and best practices for doing ethical AI. This is, I guess, still early days in this field, so tonight's talk by a pioneer in the area should be very interesting. Our speaker, of course, this evening is our college principal, Professor Sir Nigel Shadbolt. Sir Nigel began his academic career in 1978 with a double first in psychology and philosophy at the University of Newcastle. Uh, and his interests in logic, computation, and cognition led him to the Department of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh, where he obtained his PhD. Since then, he's filled a range of roles in both the public and private sectors including as the Alan Standen Professor of Intelligence Systems at the University of Nottingham, Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Southampton, Information Advisor to the UK Government, and Chairman of the Open Data Institute, which he co-founded with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society, uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the British Computer Society. He became the principal of Jesus College in 2015, uh, and he's a professor in Oxford's Department of Computer Science, where he leads the human-centered computing group. At Oxford, he's focused his research on human-centered AI in a wide range of applications. And most recently, in fact, he was asked to lead the setting up of the Oxford Institute of Ethics in AI. The title of tonight's talk is, Can AI Be Ethical? And we ask that if you have questions, we hope you do, during the talk, please write them in the chat box and they will be addressed during the Q&A session. Okay, so welcome, Sir Nigel. Uh, we're eager to hear what you have to say this evening on the ethics of AI. It's a fascinating topic. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And thank you to the GEN Network, uh, um, GEN, the actual entrepreneur, Jesus Entrepreneurs Network um, for convening and organizing tonight's event. It's great to have that represented in so many of the things that the college does. You know, the, the strength and power of entrepreneurs within the college alumni base is, is hugely uh, to our advantage. So uh, yes, title tonight, can AI, artificial intelligence be ethical? Now there's, this is a, a huge topic and um, I can really only give you a flavor of why I think this matters in, uh, in 35 minutes. Uh, we do have a good amount of time for questions, and I would love to answer those you might have. As uh, Stephen alluded to, my academic life began in AI back in 1978 when I began my PhD work in the Department of AI at the University of Edinburgh. Um, it was a heady time then, but we were under a lot of pressure. There was a notorious report um, a review in 1973 by Sir James Lighthill, uh, the Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge, who basically recommended that all AI should just be basically closed down. It was over-promising and under-delivering. Um, and through the decades that have followed that, and I, I've, I've witnessed this firsthand, there have been periods of hyperbole and uh, um, disaffection for AI, uh, moments of massive abundant funding and moments when uh, uh, people have been rather disappointed by, by achievements. I think what we've seen in truth has been a continuously improving set of techniques and methods that are able to take on a broad range of tasks. And uh, if people's notion of AI is the Terminator robot, of course, what's really happened is that AI is fundamentally about ubiquity. It's everywhere in our actual uh, lives, from increasing deployment in autonomous vehicles through to the um, web interfaces, the search engines we use, the recommender systems that present information to us to automated uh, um, healthcare, to various forms of software in the supercomputers that are our mobile phones uh, that recognize faces in photographs, 
interpret our speech and our queries to a whole host of services. Much of this powered by AI techniques and methods pioneered over the decades. So let's recognize that. And it's not about building a super sentient killer robot. Some people think that's an existential risk, but I think that what we're dealing with at the moment in current AI ethics are the practical questions that Stephen alluded to face many data scientists, may face many of us trying to deploy um, AI methods in contexts that matter. Now let's think about why AI is quite so ubiquitously uh, uh, deployed. Um, I often put this slide up, actually when I put it up periodically about every two years, I have to update it significantly. This is the, um, this is the uh, uh, famous log linear graph known as Moore's law. It shows roughly in, in quite a striking way, an exponential increase in compute power. This is reflected actually in a very crude count. People have argued forever about whether transistor count or component count uh, is a decent proxy for compute power. It stood up pretty well, actually. And all I would say about this is if I look at my own trajectory here, when I entered, began to do my PhD in 1978, um, Motorola 68000, for example, released with 68,000 transistors. I can take us through to 2018, and there is a process of the Apple A12 Bionic, which powers many modern mo uh, mobile phones, with 6.9 billion transistors. That is a six order of magnitudes increase, actually in computing uh, capability. You can argue a million fold increase in the power of the devices available, has been transformational. It's meant that AI algorithms that were incredibly compute intensive and uh, have become feasible. It's not as if AI hasn't been aware during the decades of what extraordinary computation might make possible, but the implications of that are sometimes caught us short. So that deceptively simple Moore's law embodies a huge amount for us to reflect on. And actually, even those of us working in the field can be caught out by the convergence of exponential trends. So in compute power, but also in communication power, in the power uh, memory depositing uh, technology, the ability to lay down computer memory, these things have all been increasing on exponentials. And of course, it's transfer, transformed the world around us as we well understand it. It led, at least periodically, to these kind of existential crises. And one that's familiar, of course, is uh, the one from 1997 uh, when uh, Kasparov was uh, beaten by Deep Blue, actually in a full match, May the 11th. There's this wonderful image of him captured in a state of, uh, again, almost mental anguish. Um, he famously said at the time that he played a lot of computers but never experienced anything like this. He said that he could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table. I, th I think actually, in truth, this reflects something that we've seen constantly in AI, that when the system achieves something remarkable, it unnerves us. And we begin to assume that there are all sorts of things going inside the machine that actually are not there. So we tend to anthropomorphize. We tend to think that there are mental states or there's a mentality across the table from us, a new kind of intelligence. Actually understood properly, um, Kasparov was getting at something really interesting here. Deep Blue didn't play chess in any way remotely like a human. It was searching hundreds of millions of positions a second and combined with some heuristics about which bits of the search base to look at, this resulted in uh, an extraordinary level of task achievement for the time at the time against a human activity that was seen to be representative, emblematic of, of, of human smartness. And at the time, there were lots and lots of worries about the machines taking our jobs and the AIs waking up and taking, uh, putting away with us. And lots and lots of ethical issues were uh, arose, but kind of fell away. And periodically, there seems to be these moments when a human ability 
is achieved or breached by a machine. And we ask the questions again. Interestingly, this is uh, Lee Soldal, uh, one of the world's strongest Go players, who in March 2016, just two decades after Kasparov, more or less, was beaten by DeepMind's AlphaGo. Now, Go is was thought to be was a, a game of incredibly more uh, search complexity than, than, than chess. Chess's branching factor is something on the order of 35. Uh, in the mid game, there are about 35 options available. It's something like 256 uh, in, in the Go situation. It meant that the space that had to be searched and reviewed was truly colossal. And the achievement of uh, supremacy in this case by a particular form of machine learning, again, gave rise to an awful lot of uh, soul searching. We'll come back to those issues shortly. In fact, to be fair, um, DeepMind, English uh, quartered um, AI company that was acquired by Google, has done some remarkable uh, um, AI landmark achievements. This is their version of StarCraft, which is uh, playing at a human expert level, a multi-user strategy game, basically uh, an exotic form of empire building and shoot em up, where it's looking to optimize a whole range of activities in a multi-user situation. And just last year, we had the example of AlphaFold, where the um, system was solving a, a, a a well-known, hugely challenging problem in the field of science, which is to work out how to fold in three dimensions uh, protein structures. And again, uh, the achievement in this particular task has been very impressive indeed. So we should take our collective hats off to the achievements of AI at this point. I would just like to say, however, at this point, that modern methods of machine learning um, are not so modern. The uh, neural networks that have been developed and evolved have been a concept for a very long time in AI, many decades. Um, one of the dominant methods uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s was so-called rule-based programming, where you explicitly capture the knowledge of the world as rules and as structured objects. And here is a simple illustration from the medical domain where you might encapsulate a human expert's a diagnostician's understanding of, of how to respond with a patient who had a high fever, low white blood cell count, et cetera, et cetera. And the various ways in which we organize disease hierarchies to make sense of them. Now, the interesting thing about the modern methods that are being used in AI is that they look very different. Um, the AI toolbox is a pretty wide repertoire of methods and techniques. What, what you can probably understand is that that presentation of a piece of uh, exemplary uh, of, of exemplars medical knowledge is kind of understandable. You can make sense of it by virtue of your understanding of language and structured rules. This kind of network architecture that powers many machine learning methods is more problematic. So here I'm kind of exemplifying a couple of things. One is High level of performance, these networks were used to great effect in uh, both the uh, AlphaGo example, the um, uh, system that beat the world's strongest Go player, but also in StarCraft, also in the Alpha Fold, protein folding. These deep neural networks have had a number of significant accomplishments that people have gotten excited about in recent years. And the network architecture is essentially just that. It's a set of connected nodes and the connections between those nodes are adjusted, their weight is adjusted, and through a process of adjustment of those weights to being presented repeatedly with use cases, which may be labeled or not, the system can improve. The system can adjust the weight uh, weights in that very large um, matrix that you're seeing displayed on the slide there, adjust those weights through a process of essentially um, uh, correcting for error propagation back into the network system. There are different flavors and varieties of how these machine learning methods are used, but what they can do is achieve, again, very high levels of performance on specific tasks. And this is a, an example taken from a Stanford system, which became extremely expert at classifying skin lesions. In this particular case, various forms of 
uh, benign and non-benign skin cancers. So the task is to work out from these various input um, uh, images what, what was a way of systematically determining whether the lesion was epidermal, melanocytic, whether it was benign or malignant. And this was achieving uh, human expert levels of performance. Interesting question in these systems is how scrutable are they? How transparent are they? They certainly require huge amounts of compute power. So the top left hand corner of this slide is showing you the uh, tensor processing units, the uh, racks of uh, customized hardware that Google have developed to support these kinds of um, algorithm. They are very compute hungry. Uh, and one of the uh, ways they achieve the performance they do is by having more and more hidden layers. And the more layers you put between input and output, you can play a whole range of uh, methods to optimize and improve learning. So then the question we begin to start to encounter questions that have this ethical feel. Uh, by the way, I should say that these techniques have been used uh, in everything from uh, skin cancer to uh, um, routinely being rolled out now in OCR. That's the method by which your eyes are scanned in a pharmacy and they can pick up a whole range of potential um, disease conditions. Here you're seeing a slide that represents uh, a retina that uh, is displaying a, a, um, diabetic retinopathy, which is a kind of a common uh, uh, side effect of, uh, of diabetes. These things routinely deployed um, in uh, increasing numbers across our uh, healthcare system and our primary care system. And I should also say that this isn't just about one set of techniques. So one of the companies, uh, I sit on the board of a, a company, Benevolent AI, who are combining machine learning methods with traditional rule-based and uh, explicit structured representation methods to look at other domains of, um, of huge relevance through the lockdown has been trying to understand the, the recent the ongoing epidemic has been to understand whether or not drugs that are known can have an effective deployment against the coronavirus. And this was some work that was done which detected that a uh, well-known uh, um, uh, drug in use, baricitinib, could be repurposed and has a very beneficial effect on reducing mortality. Again, the suites of techniques being used were a combination of uh, deep neural network machine learning and explicit uh, rule-based and graph-based structured object reasoning. So, I'm from medicine to autonomous vehicles. Oxbotica's very own company in autonomous vehicles is exploiting a whole range of AI methods to uh, build a class of infrastructure and software platform for autonomous vehicles. This is actually recent footage from a, uh, uh, a uh, work where it was granted a trial to test its systems in southern Germany. So uh, notwithstanding all the political realignments, uh, Oxford technology being used and uh, deployed to good effect there. Techniques of the sort that we've been talking about, machine learning techniques have been used not just in health, not just in uh, transport applications, but in areas where we immediately get a sense of the ethical uh, dilemmas. So for example, in sentencing and bail setting, um, uh, in the US, a number of trials of methods to see whether or not the uh, systems of AI could prevent or present a more equitable or possibly unbiased set of decisions in bail setting than was felt to be the case with, with human uh, decision making in these contexts. We'll come back to that. Um, and in the different jurisdictions, this is the example, the when example of, of social credit in China, the deployment of very large scale of a range of AI methods to essentially keep a sense of um, citizenship behavior uh, to the fore. Now, this is presented very differently in different contexts. You will hear Chinese citizens themselves saying they are pleased to be keep, kept safe and to be surveilled upon and their, uh, their behavior monitored. 
Um, for others, it raises huge issues. But what is clear is that the social credit system, an integrated set of data collection and algorithms that are applied from everything from getting allocated uh, um, uh, housing to being allowed to travel, being given certain sorts of privileges or being docked those privileges is being assessed within this very large architecture for um, essentially algorithmic assessment based on the behavior that is noticed or logged. So it doesn't take us long to realize that these are questions that we might want to think about regulating or managing. And here we have a challenge. There are any number of codes of conduct that have been generated in the last uh, very recent uh, couple of years. In fact, a recent uh, study published in uh, Nature Communications identified something on the order of 180 of these, of which 84 were analyzed in some detail. And here's just a kind of a list, an endless scrolling list of AI principles, codes of conduct, and so on. So the question we have to uh, ask ourselves here is, um, what's the actual insights we're deriving uh, from these codes of conduct? Um, what are we to understand from this flood of principles? So a meta-analysis of these codes of conduct uh, revealed a, a very interesting set of recurrent themes. And uh, one of the most um, uh, significant features of many of these codes of conduct was an appeal to transparency, a demand that the outputs of these algorithms were in some sense scrutable. And, and here's the challenge. Because for many of the uh, modern deployed and fielded methods, those that rely on these so-called deep neural networks, and they're deep because they have many of these hidden layers between input and output, the question of explainability and transparency is a challenging one. In fact, the whole field at the moment is engaged in an attempt to better understand the internal workings of these networks. If you don't have a rule-based engine running alongside these things that are trying to interpret uh, um, um, the behavior, what you have is a very extended weight matrix, a set of adjustments which don't bear very much inspection. In fact, there is an entire subfield of AI, referred to as AI neuroscience, which is attempting to understand how feature visualization can help make sense of what's going on in these networks. So if famously um, in this work, they use a very large scale uh, open source database called ImageNet to try and train the system to discriminate different sorts of classes of objects from car wheels to dogs, to foxes, to owls and parrots. And when you begin to inspect the internal workings of particular layers of these systems for what's being extracted, understood, it makes a certain sorts of in initial sense, but presenting these intermediate representations as some kind of causal explanation for why object, a particular input case is being classified or misclassified in a particular way feels challenging. It feels like there's a particular issue here. And this is exacerbated by recent work that has shown how networks, when put into competition with one another, can learn to fool one another. So here's an example, famously, uh, from research that showed a, a system that was perfectly capable of identifying this image as a bubble, and this image as a peacock. If you then set up another network, to attempt to generate images that could reliably fool the first network into making a high confidence prediction, what was produced ultimately in this adversarial network was often a screen full of apparent static. So this was an image generated by a certain network to fool this network into thinking this was a peacock with 99% confidence. This is a bubble with 99% confidence. So you can begin to see that at the bottom of this issue, this desire for transparency, we have a collision between the methods we're using and their scrutability. 
Now, how can we respond to that? There's literally an arms race going on here. Uh, one of uh, my colleague, Marta uh, Kwiatkowska, uh, is doing work where she's trying to get a formal parameterization of what this susceptibility is. Uh, and so she's here looking famously at examples where a single pixel uh, um, manipulation of a situation or a video or an image can get the system to reliably misclassify. Now, this is an approach that tries to put bounded guarantees, not certainty, but a degree of statistical certainty around the likelihood of misclassifying given a particular network's task context and structure. But that brings us back to this question of what are the ethical commitments we're making with our system? Transparency, you'll remember, was high on the list. Another feature that came out was the notion of safety and non-malfeasance. So the worry in systems like autonomous vehicles is how safe can they provably keep us? Or can we know that the images that are being fed into my classification scheme are actually ones that have not been in some sense doctored so that there's some clever placement of a structure not obvious to us as human observers that will get the system to reliably misclassify. And it's this whole argument that what do we do in the face of black boxes in, um, in AI? Another ethical conundrum that has become and is naturally a very much at the forefront of our thinking is the whole issue around privacy um, or privacy. So this is a topic again that, that, that I've written on uh, with my colleague, uh, rather too presciently, I fear, back in 2008, we wrote a book called The Spy and the Coffee Machine, The End of Privacy as We Know It. And we used The Spy and the Coffee Machine as a bit of an homage to an early attempt to connect Cambridge University's uh, coffee machine uh, in the computer lab up to the internet with a little camera. Well, you can buy such a coffee machine uh, off of Amazon right now for 469 that will connect to the internet and uh, reliably surveil whoever takes their coffee. And the challenge here is the ability to deploy sensors and smart algorithms at scale has run well ahead of any regulation about what we should or shouldn't allow that to do. We've already invited the strangers into our homes by way of smart devices that will control the music we hear or indeed make appointments in the restaurant down the road. Uh, some people have done this with frankly reckless abandon. Uh, this company, a startup uh, that was mercifully short-lived called Cloud Pets, uh, managed to have its awful so uh, security breached. Uh, it actually was uh, recording the conversations between um, children and parents and these uh, smart toys. Um, the details, personal details of both conversations and the individual account holders were hacked and 800,000 of them went uh, uh, into a whole bunch of uh, undisclosed locations. And that has caused people to think harder, I think, about the security implications. But it's not as if we have really strong rules of the road that guide the deployment of these methods and techniques. You combine that with the fact that there is a general concern that the platforms that collect some of this data, they're not just uh, uh, ill-conceived startups, they are the largest platforms you can imagine in the uh, tech ecosystem, the Googles and Amazons, Ebays in the West, the Baidus, Tencent, Alibabas in the East. And this is not to attribute any malign intent, but it's just a fact that these have become extraordinary repositories of, uh, of data and data flows. And as we have, my own group has analyzed some of the data flows um, that have arisen in this ecosystem. And uh, for whatever um, reasons, the tendency of these platforms to super concentrate the data flows in advertising, in a whole range of other service offers means that there's actually under the bonnet when you're running your apps on your mobile phone, little accountability around where data is being concentrated, what people are doing with it. 
uh, recent work, I should say, where we've been looking at pre and post the GDPR, this famous piece of uh, European legislation that is meant to give more control over users as to how their data might be used is that as far as the license is concerned and we can discern, there's been no material change in any of the behaviors of the data flows as far as we can see at all. And in fact, we really do need to ask if we come up with reasonable guidelines about what may or may not be appropriate or proportionate uses of our data, how are we ever going to have the confidence that these are actually uh, being followed or enforced or are seen to be proportionate. Now, we also understand that from the evidence of the pandemic, that these issues of rights and entitlements of ethical norms and guidelines they're not absolute. Uh, in the very most recent work um, that I'm doing with, with Tim Berners-Lee, we have an Oxford Martin School project called uh, Ethical Web and Data Architectures, where one of the challenges we're setting ourselves is to imagine new kinds of technology, new kinds of architecture for the web, and new kinds of institutions that might better balance off these interests around uh, data control, autonomy, um, self-determination on what happens with that data, data that has an ability to describe the terms of use, uh, the, 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 the means and ends to which it might be put. So that's very literally a project that's about to start on the 1st of June, a uh, work in progress, but this is actually our attempt to try and get some progress with the underlying technology the technological infrastructure and the institutional infrastructure that we might new, need in this new emerging world. And in the meantime, there are these ethical questions. And I think I wanted to kind of just uh, uh, close out on those reflections for a while. And Oxford is a jolly good place to be thinking about these things, not least because it has this extraordinary tradition of ethical and moral philosophy. And we will come on to the issue of whether moral and ethical philosophers are what we need in this discussion. I think very strongly they are. There was uh, R.M. Hare's wonderful uh, uh, work on moral thinking, Iris Murdoch's Sovereignty of Good, um, Derek Parfitt's On What Matters, the magisterial review on how you understand the various uh, issues and values and choices we have before us. And Mary Warnock herself, who was... Um, a graduate of this place and then went on, of course, to, to Cambridge and do really important work in the application of ethical principles in a fast emerging technical domain, scientific domain. Her work in helping establish and set up the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, after a really deep amount of ethical reflection and conversations across various stakeholders provided a set of norms that allowed certain sorts of research to be taken on in the UK, I think we can say in a really positive context where in other jurisdictions there were real problems with uh, getting consent from the, the wider, wider population about the benefits and harms of doing this work. Serious ethical thinking in advance can be incredibly helpful. And we see that again in the emergence of medical ethics. And I use medical ethics as a very good um, exemplar. We don't have all of the answers for AI ethics at this point. I've raised some of the major issues that we're facing and they're not by any means exclusively um, um, an exhaustive enumeration. But let's take the case of medical ethics. A number of decades ago, um, you can reach back 100 years, you can reach back 70 years, and there was a whole set of medical practice which was essentially ethically unconstrained. People, of course, had signed up to the Hippocratic Oath. There was a professional kind of code of practice, do no harm to your patients. But within that, important um, frameworks had not been developed. We can look back to the way in which patients were treated with severe mental health problems. Uh, young children were subject to a whole range of, of, of coercive treatments. In fact, adults as well, uh, various forms of neurosurgery that were, were, were inflicted on them. So issues around what human subject work could be embarked upon, how that was controlled, 
the notion of informed consent, that experts don't necessarily know best, that you need to have an extended interaction between patient and expert. Edu equitable access to the resources and technologies available was a very pressing issue. In fact, the emergence of dialysis suites was partly a response to the fact that in the early days, kidney dialysis machines were very, very few and far between. And there was a genuine issue about who should have access to this new technology. And in other areas, medical ethics, through the engagements of a whole range of serious philosophical thinking, from epistemologists to metaphysicians, from people interested in the philosophy of language, have thought about whether we had the concepts we needed to make progress in medicine as new techniques and methods became available. The concept of brain death, the concept of futility of care. These ideas have evolved and have really been enriching to the practice and deployment of medicine. Medical ethics started much of its serious life in departments where concerns around how certain could we be about clinical outcomes? How should those certainties be conveyed to subjects? How should indeed explanations and accountability work between professional, uh, professional uh, um, practitioners and, and patients? And if we then look at another great protagonist for ethics in the Oxford context, the great Isaiah Berlin also counseled us when we do this work not to believe that there are simple nostrums, that there's a single code of conduct that we can take off the shelf that will guide our thinking in all of these matters. Uh, in his wonderful inaugural lecture, Two Concepts of Liberty, which he delivered in uh, 1958 in Oxford, his inaugural lecture, he uh, developed the idea in the case of freedom, and we can recognize this, I would suggest, in responses to the pandemic. The British tradition of negative freedom, he discerned, as the ability to be free from interference. He saw this as a, as a strain of thought that was pervasive in the way that we encountered various issues about rights and entitlements in our uh, British deliberations. A more libertarian view, he traced back to what he called positive freedom, this idea of self-mastery, self-determination, uh, uh, what we're free to do. And, and his analysis uh, pointed out uh, some really interesting trade-offs. In fact, his entire philosophy, as many of you may know, was around pluralism. The fact that actually in our values, we, there are incompatibilities and we need to understand analytically, how to distinguish trade-offs between these preferences, these views, rather than simply conflate them. So one of the tasks for the philosophers, the ethicists, those of us practicing and working at the research edge of AI, is to understand how to unpack concepts like transparency, fairness, safety, privacy, in a pluralistic way, to understand the trade-offs we have when we talk about privacy preserving computation in all circumstances as an inalienable right, or do we understand that in certain public health contexts we're prepared to waive and vary the stipulations we bring to bear? So absolutist ethics is probably not the ethics that the Institute for Ethics in AI will be formulating, but it'll be trying to understand this complex trade-off space, this extraordinarily interesting and rich bringing together of techniques from AI, societal challenges, and our responses to them that are based around our preferences, our values, the kind of society we want to uh, live in and be part of. And that's one reason why I'm very excited that both in terms of my technical AI research, but also in setting up an institution here at Oxford, the Oxford Institute for Ethics and AI, which is bringing together also and um, drawing on extraordinary expertise from around the place. Um, that's the great, the great thrill of the Oxford uh, decentralized model is that we have 
of existing departments of computer science, uh, the Oxford Internet Institute, information engineering, the Bank School of Government, practical, uh, Center for Practical Ethics, Alan Turing Institute involvement, a whole range of contributing core activity and convening some of that around the challenges of ethics in AI will be our new institute uh, headed by John Tassoulis. It will occupy part of the fabulous new humanities center to be built over the next number of years. And one of the core members of staff appointed is our very own uh, Philip uh, Milo, um, uh, Philip Brown, uh, who is uh, our um, lecturer in uh, philosophy and uh, computer science. Uh, who uh, joins us from MIT and is actually uh, going to be working on just some of the challenges that we've been talking about here. It's a very broad and complex space, and it is in need of ethical attention. And, and don't expect there to be just a simple uh, overarching solution to any of this. So uh, there we go. Um, can we open up to the normal mode now? Is that possible? There we go. All right. Well, thanks, Sir Nigel. That was fantastic. A great overview. Uh, lots of reasons for caution uh, and optimism, though, I think. Um, and we've already got some great questions come in. Um, let me start with uh, this one, which I think is particularly interesting. Um, this is from Dujana. You mentioned drafting a set of guidelines to govern AI. Given the rapid growth of AI compared to the relatively sluggish rate at which our common law system reacts, do you think we'll ever be able to completely govern and regulate the use of AI? Yeah, that is that is um, that is a really interesting ongoing challenge. Um, I suppose there's an interesting challenge here. You may be aware that the European Union, the EU, has got out for. Uh, uh, consultation, uh, a set of regulations around the, um, essentially around um, the management and regulation of AI. Um, and this is in the style of, um, if you will, that normative approach that says, can we anticipate the various problems that will arise and, and, and think about them such that we can pass laws? There is a very different common law approach, which is show us the harm, okay? And, and, and off that, you build your kind of case law in a sense. Um, the relatively sluggish. Well, it's interesting to reflect on how quickly uh, we're able to recruit changes to new developing technologies. I think the reason I'm always impressed by the Warnock report and then subsequent implementation in the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority was that they quite rapidly and in advance of some of the technological breakthroughs sketched a possible landscape where there needed to be control. Okay. Now, people say the problem is the gene is out the bottle in AI. And what we're having to do now is, um, is fix things after the fact. I actually think there is an awful lot of existing law that can help us. Um, and there, there is a, a current discussion around the online harms bill. Um, and a lot of people are making the observation that we have in our physical environments well understood law and legislation around a duty of care. And the duty of care extends to the fact that if I trip over pavements or there are uh, egregious kind of obstacles in the public space or in a child's playground, somebody will be held accountable for that and they can be brought to book. And the question is that in the digital square, why we, we need something similar. So we will need some clear guidelines about those harms and how they should be managed and regulated. And you're seeing that begin to emerge. People think it may be late after the fact, um, but I think articulating it in terms of harms. Now, people's argue, arguments are all around, have we got the right set of harms and are we going to kind of have the right kind of regulatory and redress machinery. But again, I think if we look back in various legislation around safety in physical context, it's surprising how many of those harms will translate across into the digital. So it isn't about inventing new law. It's often about repurposing and extending the scope of existing stuff. But it's a good question. Are we fleet enough afoot? It's one reason why I think the study and pursuit of research in this area, the intersection between AI and law is so critically important. Just quickly, a related question to that from Martin, who says, you know, who do we trust 
to create these governance mechanisms. He, he claims rather pessimistically that we can't expect the legislators even to understand the science. Um, I assume it's academia, business, who, who's, gonna, who's gonna drive this? Yeah, you know, again, let's just reflect on the fact that computing is a dual use technology and we, we are used to dealing with dual use technologies. I mean, whether you can argue about how effectively we've done that, but I mean, chemical science, biological science, nuclear science have all led to problematic developments as well as beneficial ones. And even the beneficial ones have had to engage in a degree of regulation to uh, bring them into to, to norms and standards. So, um, and the idea that regulation is always going to be the dead hand of, I mean, there, there seems to me a really interesting opportunity to, to develop quite innovative forms of regulation in the digital age. So uh, one area where um, uh, we're looking at this is um, the idea of self-describing data. So data that carries around rich descriptions about the modes of use, the way it might be used, its uh, characteristics like uh, time out, the level, the jurisdictions it can be applied in. Now, you might say that will never stop deep misappropriation of data, but it is a first line of defense, the idea that you've no idea where the data is from or how it's provenance and so on. So. I think you've got to have a, com a belief that the regulators will increasingly need to contain people who do understand the science. And in the same way that not everybody had to be a nuclear physicist or indeed a, um, a life scientist to understand the issues underlying the deep uncertainties around biology and its deployment or biological science or uh, nuclear science its deployment, these can be represented in a way that makes the challenge, the regulatory challenge clear. Now, then the challenge is, 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 is have we got the means of bringing pressure to bear or, or, or implementing those regulations? And that's where people worry about the fact that some of the very large platforms are, um, are do they fall under real jurisdictional control? And, and, and how do we govern um, um, in that context? You know, I thought those uh, examples you showed of um, people essentially hacking pictures and being able to tilt the neural networks were really striking. Mark asked a question about this. Um, you gave the examples you gave of the ease with which AI can be fooled. He asks, um, are they actually sufficient to warrant real immediate reconsideration of those methods as they're used in, say, medicine or automated driving or so on? I mean, how bad are those examples? Well, I think there's a real awareness that they're, uh, they're, that they're significant. I mean, there's, there's a huge effort at the moment uh, to work out how we can secure the, uh, the systems against backdoor attacks or <laughs> for any kind of attack, model inversion attacks. There's a whole range of susceptibilities that people working in security in these systems are aware of, right back to the training set. So how do we know that somebody hasn't already infiltrated the the training images or, for example, that might be given to a system. What kind of uh, systems can we run to, to notice that? And there is a, there's an entire emerging research area of perturbation theory where they're looking to see how, um, how you can build um, essentially um, the equivalent of virus scanning methods. You know, it, it's happened in steganography. You know, again, this, this whole idea where you try to develop uh, countermeasures to notice whether or not you have got a true and unadulterated content going into the system. Uh, and, and I think that is, a, that is a concern. I think we need to set some quite high standards around the, the, the methods and proof and the, the harnesses we put these systems through to test. And, and there are the well-known ones, of course, around uh, demographic representation, which is classically, uh, you know, I showed you examples of a certain set of uh, uh, skin disorders and you will not have failed to notice that the pigmentation in those skin samples was fairly uniform. So there's an issue there about have we, are we representative in this algorithm's behavior of the full range of, um, of material that the system will be exposed to or individual subjects if it's a medical context? And if not, how do we, how do we recognize that and build that into the equity and assessment criteria? So there is just a huge, uh, I think if you want to pick a booming profession of the 21st century, 
it's accountability and audit auditability of data and algorithms. Uh, you know, tax reports are one thing. The underlying feedstock of our decision making is the next thing that will need to be scrutinized and understood for, um, I think, uh, fairness and probity. Great. We've got so many fantastic questions. There's a, a couple that I think are related, which is sort of how much can you automate this? Uh, uh, Talita asks, do you think having a human in the loop uh, is sufficient uh, to safeguard against the shortcomings of AI? Jeff asked, how do you take into account deliberate attacks when it's so difficult even to check the internals of a system? I mean, how much is automation and human uh, oversight enough? Um, it seems like these are very complicated problems. To yeah, make. it is. You know, in general, I've always been an advocate for augmented intelligence. That is to say, imagine embedding your algorithms and data within um, with it, with, within contexts and settings where there is uh, there is human assessment evaluation as well as machine based, and that and, and, and in fact, even in the cases we're seeing these extraordinary advances in um, in AI and health. The important thing to remember is the original objective functions are set by the individual by humans. They're not set by machines, and the um, they often work particularly well when they're helping um, accelerate search through spaces, very large spaces of possibilities for drugs, effective drugs, or uh, uh, potential side effects, and all the rest of it. And used in that way as a tool that augments and has always seemed to me a sound principle. It won't happen always. I mean, you will have some genuine closed loop situations where you think you want to put the uh, either decision making cycles are too short or you want you, you've got reasonable confidence. You've got strong confidence in the ability of the algorithm within the defined context in which it's being put. The danger is that too many deployment examples are in these open ended contexts where you haven't thought of all the possible uh, failure modes potentially or all the possible compromise modes and, and humans are extremely ingenious at thinking up new ways to uh, subvert or repurpose and, and 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 if you build machines then that try and embed that embed that ability to kind of find the weakness you have got this literal arms race so i think we'll see an awful lot of work in that area um and I think that we need to be aware of where the the human in the loop adds really important wider contextual considerations and slowing down the pace of the decision making cycle can be really quite helpful in many contexts as well. Um, evaluating the out of range possibilities, evaluating modes of failure that people haven't simply thought of. I mean, the machines are always terrible at the at the wider context question. You know, we will understand a failure mode when we've seen it and think, well, of course that makes sense now, but of course anticipating it is something else. I think the whole area of explainable AI and combining methods which are symbolic, and I use that phrase to think of rule-based, capable of being expressed in ways that are more amenable, and, uh, and the sub-symbolic methods is going to be it's ironic that we'll need to develop almost an AI neuroscience, decode the internal operations of these systems in a way that helps us understand their underlying principles. And when we see those principles, in some cases, they won't make a lot of sense to us. They'll be performatively very good, but quite remote from the way that we solve these problems. And that will be then a question about what sorts of explanations we accept as being acceptable explanations and again that that's an area of active research you know what 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 convinces somebody to believe in the behavior of the algorithm even when i can't necessarily be convinced by its weight internal state the fact it's classifying people like me in a consistent way is something i recognize or the fact that i'm uh, in this part of a demographic is something i can recognize yeah yeah claire just asked a question related to that which is uh you know First of all, how do you decide which ethical framework within which to govern your algorithms? Of course, there are there are different views of ethics as you go around the world and you go across different economic strata and so on. Um, so that's a, an, an extra layer of complexity. Yeah, and that's back to kind of the Berlin insight, really, that there won't be you know, this idea you kind of swap. Uh, you have these kind of modules you 
swap in and out. It's much more to be the case that, uh, and, and this is the case in medical ethics, when you see uh, a discipline that's been maturing for decades, struggling with questions of uh, futility of care in premature babies with incurable conditions, you kind of see the forces that come into play when people are rooted in a particular set of religious beliefs or a particular set of utilitarian beliefs. You, there are collisions of these values. And, and that does clearly also vary across the world. I mean, there's been this fascinating work on um, estimating um, how different populations view things like common goods or public goods or um, uh, the value we invest in the classic one is the trolley problem of course where the moral machines project uh, at MIT discovered that of course um, there is a much higher level of veneration for the little old lady crossing the road than uh, in some cultures than others so the, the, the idea that we we all carry around the same set of values uh, and we can um, trade between consistent frameworks. I think the thing that we need to understand is our frameworks are always working in a degree of tension against one another. And that's important because it rec we recognize then that different things that we value in a situation are differently important. And we, we can't do better than look at various algorithmic allocations of vaccine to susceptible patients in the current COVID situation is that what was the right legitimate way to um, assess the allocation of initially scarce vaccines to the at-risk population? You know, what, and, and different, different, different uh, uh, um, um, societies, different uh, governments have come up with different estimates around that. Yeah. Uh, so I, 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 I recognise the problem. I think the important thing about the of serious ethics in AI is to debate. The issue seriously and not believe there is a trite set of guidelines you can just pull off the shelf. Guidelines are helpful, but they are they they are broad heuristics, and very often the challenge is in the edge case. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe time for just one more question. A couple of people have related to have brought this up. Guy asks, um, and I think you're generally an optimist in this area. I think Sir Nigel, you would say that. Um, but he asks, do you worry that there is a growing separation between a highly technical future, of course, the use of AI, and a lack of public understanding of how those systems work. Do you think that this might lead to growing resentment? Yeah, I think it's a, that's a definite concern. Um, I think it's always been there. And, and, and as AI becomes almost an unseen utility, I mean, the fact that we don't remark particularly that there's this amazing speech recognition system that isn't faintly interested in you or aware of you, but is nevertheless driving the right kind of responses back and forth to you. That's just there. And at a certain point, we'll become quite animist about this. You know, these systems will, for many people, be um, invested with properties they actually don't have. That's the other side of this, which is quite interesting. So the disconnect, it is that famous quote, isn't it? At some point, your, your, your technology becomes indistinguishable from magic. And, um, um, the duty is on us always to attempt to uh, demythologize and take out the, it is why you know, I, I, I love the effort to reground people's experience in these devices, in these methods to say, ultimately, these have to be scrutable. This, this isn't magic all the way up. This is about understanding where complexity is added where principles that we are familiar with, if you want to see a complex system we barely understand, I think systems biology is a good place to look. You know, human, we as human organisms are kept in this delicate uh, state of, of, of well-being for some of the time, despite the fact that these extraordinary systems almost, you know, uh, have evolved to be just about uh, uh, in train with, 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 with each other and, and, and are constantly on the edge of doing themselves considerable harm. And I think it is just so fascinating to think about the, the requirement hasn't gone away for us to understand our biology any more than it will our technology and how we try and demyth. De and a talk like this evening, we can't get into the details of this recurrent network or reinforcement versus supervised learning, but we can try and unpack some of the top level issues in a way that people say, okay, I get why that's a challenge. You know, a, a system that fundamentally operates sub-symbolically 
is going to present a set of challenges to us when it comes to issues of transparency, accountability, and, and take that sort of question and work out where the other material questions are in this space. Great. Well, it's seven o'clock in the UK. It's time for dinner, but it's very tempting to go on because there's just so many great questions and your answers have been fascinating. But maybe we'll wrap up here and I'll thank you again, Sir Nigel, for your talk. And I'll thank all of the attendees for coming and asking great questions. Good to know that you and the college and Oxford are, are thinking about these things. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, especially Sir Nigel. No, thank you very much. I enjoyed it and great questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hope to see you in college soon, uh, really soon. Yeah, so take care, everybody. Thank you.